We often believe that families are based on shared genes, that biology itself creates families. Yet in my professional and personal experience, I've surely found that the healthiest of families are based not on genetics, but on deep love and connection. Through this lens, we might appreciate that children who are adopted can be embraced as part of a family with as much love and devotion as children who are biologically related. Although adoptive parents and their children may encounter unique blessings and challenges, the truth is that real family is created, not born. Today, we'll focus on this listener's real-life question. My partner and I can't have children. We've been looking into adopting a baby, but I have some concerns. My adoptive parents were not perfect. They treated me differently from my bio sister, so I have some trauma around not feeling like part of the family. I am excited about bringing a child into our lives, but I'm afraid my history will get in the way. How can my partner and I be good adoptive parents? And with that question as the focus of today's episode, I'm Dr. Carla Marie Manley, and this is Imperfect Love. Welcome to Imperfect Love with Dr. Carla Marie Manley, psychologist, author, and relationship expert. I'm here to help unravel mysteries and misconceptions about love, relationships, and mental health issues, plus everything in between. Love is complicated, people are not perfect, and relationships surely can be tough. Together, we'll navigate this messy, imperfect space of real life. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, Dr. Denise Wagner, who will be sharing her expertise on parenting, adoption, and creating a loving home for adopted children. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Denise. I am so excited and delighted to share time with you today. I know you have such an extensive background, not just in psychotherapy and parenting and adopting, but in so many other realms of what it takes to make a happy, healthy relationship, a happy, healthy partnership, a wonderful family. So welcome. I can't wait to discuss today's question with you. Oh, thank you. I'm really happy to be here. And I think that this listener has an excellent question. Terrific. So before we dive into the listener's question, which I know will take us in many directions, and I think that'll be absolutely fabulous. Tell us a little bit about what makes you, you. Well, let's see. I always think of um, the fact that I grew up in San Francisco a big part of my identity and all the music I was exposed to and just, you know, growing up in San Francisco was just great. I didn't discover that I was creative until about mm, 20 years ago, I guess, when I was at a family camp with my son and they had, um, you know, arts and crafts for the kids and then they had arts and crafts for the adults. And there was a mosaic workshop And I walked by and I thought, oh, no, I'm not really creative. I can't really do that. And the woman that was leading it said, you can't do anything wrong with mosaics. You know, just just do it. So I did it. And since then, I've really improved um, and grown in my art. And um, that's a big part of how I keep my sanity. Ah, I love that. Well, and I know I've seen some of your mosaic work. And in fact, I have a beautiful piece of your pottery behind me, one of your owls, which I (laughs) absolutely adore. Little guy watches over me. Mm -hmm. So what is the name of your, so that our guests can maybe find you? What's the name of your mosaic company? It's Labor of Love Mosaics. And I came up with the name just because that's exactly what it is. I mean, it totally takes me to a different place. When I'm doing that, I don't think about anything else. And I think we all need some of that in our lives. Thank you for, for bringing that up. And your the name of your business reminded me, Labor of Love Mosaics. You had also made me a mosaic with a piece of my mother's history in it. Um, so yes, it is certainly a labor of love and not only 
for you and it keeps you grounded and balanced and sane. Yet when I think of all the gifts that you give to other people through the loving pieces that you make, I am so glad we touched on that because it reminded me of that really essential and very beautiful part of you. So now let's dive into today's piece about adoption and tell us a little bit about what you as a clinician see first in the realm of adoption and for the adoptive parents and the adoptive children, how that sets the stage for some of the unique challenges and blessings that come when we integrate a family? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, you know, this listener hit the nail on the head when she said that I'm aware that I have some trauma and I'm not sure if that's going to interfere with me being a parent. Well, I think that She's got fertile ground for growth there because we have to see that parenting, whether it's adopted children or birth children, is a very, mm, there's a lot of skills involved that we're not really born with. And so um, there's education that needs to happen. I think that more people than we know have family trauma history and the best thing I think before getting having a child placed is to get find a therapist who has training and attachment therapy. Um, and I would make sure that that's, you know, you, that you ask the therapist what kind of training that they've had, because a lot of people, you know, are throwing around attachment, but it's very specific when you're working with uh, children who've been in foster care and are being adoption, which is where the majority of adoptions happen. And so there's, if they could find a therapist that they can start with, that when a child does come with them, then the therapist knows the couple well and will be able to do mm, probably more work in a, in a quicker way. Um, So there's that. And the other thing, too, is dealing with the loss of infertility, because if that's not really worked through, it'll make it difficult because there will be, I think, regret of not being able to have their own child when they're faced with challenges with their adoptive child. So that's an issue I think that really needs to be addressed as well. Thank you so much for pointing out these pieces, which is why this is your specialty. You know all the nuances. So a flurry of questions are coming up in my own mind. So when we are looking at this this parent, this or, or this woman who wants to be a parent, wants to be a mom, mm-hmm. and she, you're saying, okay, get therapy to a deal with any trauma from your family of origin that Mm -hmm. is not resolved which makes sense because whether we're adopting a child or having our own children we want to deal with any trauma that's unresolved because unresolved trauma some people think it goes away with chronological time and you and i both know as clinicians trauma will exist until you get hold of it Mm -hmm. so you're advising her very wisely get therapy so that anything that is unresolved from your from your family your adoptive family that all those hurts and wounds that you've worked through them or are working through them that piece and then you're saying now you're grieving your loss of fertility and so that's something separate and I hadn't thought of that piece so you're saying okay let's really look in this therapeutic setting with the counselor that you engage with, look at how you will be grieving that loss of this part of being um, a mom. And Mm -hmm. that way you can fully embrace rather than regret or resent this new little being coming into your life. Mm -hmm. That's true. And it's, you know, I think many women who want to be mothers start having that fantasy when they're like maybe four or five years old. So a typical age of an adoptive parent is mid thirties 
um, to 40s. Basically, I mean, that's where the big group is because that's when infertility strikes typically during those years. So um, unless it's the infertility is due to surgery. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's it's just a big dream that has to be let go. And thank you again for pointing that out, because we often think, OK, a, a divorce there's grieving there, a parting of a long-term relationship, grieving there, the death of a partner, death of a parent, death of a child, all those things are grieving. Yet I love that you're highlighting a loss of fertility is also something that a hope and dream, and you're right, from the time a, a, a child of any gender holds their first baby doll and does the feeding mm -hmm. and the diapering, there is a part that right. might be imagining someday I'm going to be a parent with a real baby and doing all of this. So mm -hmm. excellent, excellent advice. Thank you. So let's go to another question that I had. Okay. When you were talking about adoption and the foster care piece, and again, something I didn't, so most babies who are adopted, most children who are adopted are not adopted at birth. They're mostly adopted from foster care. Mm -hmm. That's oh, true. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And what's the average age of an of a child being adopted from foster mm -hmm. care? I believe it's about mm, five or six. Five or six. Okay. Yeah. So this child has had five to six years at least because yeah. some people are going to adopt younger. Some are going to adopt an 11-year-old, 12-year-old, 14-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're looking at this babe this child has been on the planet five to six years sometimes through multiple homes sometimes through significant trauma by the time they are adopted mm -hmm. that's you're the expert here that's a big piece yes it's huge i'll tell you a story about a client that i had a little girl who was i think seven when i when i started seeing her and with the model of therapy that i use i always have the parent and the child together in, in the therapy because the therapist can model what the parenting really should look like. So they're learning that. And the goal is not for the child to become attached to me. The, the goal is for the attachment to develop and grow with the adoptive parent. So um, this little girl had been in three or four foster homes. She kept, they say, the child failed placement. Well, the placement didn't work. It wasn't really the child's fault. So um, I was seeing her, and she was having difficulty with end caprices. So she would soil her, her underwear at, at school and have accidents mm -hmm. at home. And I was working her with for her, I don't know, I would say at least three months. And finally, I was asking her about, we had talked about eating it with her birth mom before, but we got more specific into it. And I asked her, um, you know, did she feed herself? How did she get food? And basically a lot of times there wasn't any food in the house. So she wasn't pooping because she had no nutrition. Oh, she wasn't God. eating. And so that was something that just happened naturally, you know. And so now she's in a situation where if she's going to have a bowel movement, it's a new experience for her. It's scary. You know, she doesn't really know what's going to happen. All those things. And something like this is out of the experience of most of us, unless we have experienced similar trauma. And so it can be shocking to the parents. It can be, um, they may wonder like, oh my God, what did I get myself into? This is way over my head, um, you know, and create more of a barrier to the attachment. It's a really sad yet important story that illuminates how when you're adopting a child, 
particularly when they are not adopted straight at birth, you mm -hmm. are inheriting as part and parcel of that adoption, all mm -hmm. of that child's history that may not and likely was not filled with love, consistency, excellent, you know, healthy food, and all yep. of the things that we as clinicians know are essential for a child to grow up and develop. What we are really focusing on next is the safe and loving attachment. And I agree with you, that word is now in vogue. So parent people are talking about attachment this, attachment that, I'll take an attachment quiz, not realizing how you know, attachment is one of the most well-researched elements in the world of psychotherapy and how important it is for us to realize that attachment isn't just, I'm secure, I'm insecure, insecurely attached, mm -hmm. I'm avoidant, I'm anxious attachment, what, whatever we're looking at, we have to go back to the roots of attachment and look mm -hmm. at how a child from birth forward is either learning from watching and being with that parent and those parents' interactions, mm -hmm. how it feels to be in the world. Is the world a safe, loving, and good enough place mm -hmm. to be? Or is it a scary place to be? A mm -hmm. scary and inconsistent place to be? So you're the expert here. We're looking at children. I would hazard a guess, but you tell me that most adopt children who are adopted probably had a very insecure history or are mm -hmm. not securely attached. I think that that's a fair assumption. And, you know, some children are more resilient than others. And so they, if they s develop a good attachment with the foster parent or adoptive parent, um, then they can grow from there. And it might be an easier journey. Um, we learn about ourselves by how our parents, and I'm just going to say mother, because most times a mother, just the just the act of breastfeeding, having eye contact, um, being held, all those things are a very important part of attachment. Um, if a child is, we talk a lot about emotional regulation. So if we want the child to be emotionally regulated, whether they're crying as an infant or throwing a tantrum when they're older, um, we have to stay calm. So if the mother, so if I pick up my baby and my baby is just, you know, crying and upset, and maybe I don't know why, to pick up the baby, hold the baby, soothe the baby, and the baby will pick up on my emotional state and be able to calm down. And this is true throughout, you know, they're growing up, even with teenagers. So that I think that that's an important skill. The emotional regulation. So for this, let's weave it back because this is such a critical point. And the emotional regulation, I could imagine, let's, for this listener who wrote in, her saying, okay, I'm working through my trauma and my sense of not being part of this family. So now I have a baby and the baby's screaming and, or even a, a, a mom who has a, you know, a child, a bio child, right? We get these moments where we want to scream. We want oh. the baby screaming and we want to scream. Baby's, baby's crying and we want to run to the other room to help alleviate some of her fears around this, how would you suggest that she or any parent who's feeling, wait a second, I, I hear Dr. Denise talking about how great it is to sit and oh, baby to chest, mm -hmm. but I'm tired, I'm anxious, and I'm sleep deprived. How would you recommend that someone who is not feeling emotionally regulated themselves, mm -hmm. how would you suggest that they find that skill? Yeah. Well, hopefully some of that happens in therapy um, and training. If they're going, if they're foster parents and then they become adoptive parents, they do go through a certain amount of training to prepare them for that. Um, I think that we all 
have times when we're just overwhelmed and feel like I cannot take any more. We have to kind of talk to ourselves and say, I'm tired. I'm feeling anxious. I need to take a deep breath. This is only going to last for a while. I can help my baby to calm down, you know, and then just to kind of have that kind of mantra and, you know, nap when the baby naps, um, you know, get some, if you have a partner, get your partner involved, whether it's, you know, doing some of the housework or cooking some of the meals or taking care of the baby while you have, you know, get a massage or something, whatever it is that helps you take care of yourself. You know, when I was talking about doing mosaics, the, the research that they've done says that artwork gives you the same benefit as meditation. A lot of people feel like they can't meditate, but really getting in that zone where you're not thinking about anything else, it can be very healing. So I think the mom needs to think about what soothes her and make sure that she builds that into her everyday life and, you know, build more confidence. Of course she she's tired and of course she's anxious, but she can do this. She's got this in there. She loves her baby. Now I'm not talking about babies with colic and that, I mean, because I know, you know, listeners might think, Oh, you know, she thinks every everything's all hunky dory. No, there are some problems that need other intervention as well. But I think asking for help and believing in yourself and taking care of yourself is really important. And I think all three of those tips, I, I really appreciate that you brought up the creative piece again, mm -hmm. because that is often something, whether we're using an adult coloring book or you with mosaics, maybe for some people it's cooking. And you're right, there is, we often think meditation means I need 30 minutes to sit in, in yoga style and be absolutely calm. Mm -hmm. No, meditation can be walking, it can be raking leaves, it can be gardening, it can be creating. For me, I love vacuuming. I find vacuuming mm -hmm. very meditative, the sound uh -huh. and sweeping a floor. It can be anything that gets you into that zone mm -hmm. of, so I love that you're recommending this for our listener, but for all parents, if you are, because this will give you that internal resilience and and sustenance so that when your child is emotionally dysregulated that you can you have enough inside yourself that you can take that deep breath in deep breath out and as you said remember even though it feels like it's lasting forever it it's temporary and then the other piece that you said is to really look for your support in your partner. And we mm -hmm. often think as parents or as a mom that we need to do it alone. So having a partner or someone there to support. And the other piece that I really think we tend to not talk enough about is the fact that there are resources available, often free resources. And could you tell us a little bit in your experience what those resources in people's communities may look like. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully they, I mean, until the adoption is final, which takes some time, they have a social worker. There are um, parenting coaches. There are wraparound services. Um, and, you know, watching videos, finding, you know, something that, I guess finding a therapist is a good resource of, you know, what's available as well. I was thinking about, um, you know, we're talking about this baby. A lot of times when children are placed, they're older than that. When I um, was first doing attachment work, I went back to school to get my doctorate because I really wanted to learn more about, about attachment. I was an attach I was a, an adoption social worker in, in California at the time. Well, I didn't learn anything about attachment in, in my doctoral program, but I started training with um, Daniel Hughes. He developed a form of therapy called dyadic developmental psychotherapy, which 
you know, it's the parent and child. Mm -hmm. um, so one of his acronyms is, is place, playfulness, loving, accepting, curious, and empathic. Okay. Mm. So with a child that's four or five or beyond um, and is upset, you know, the parent should not put the child in their room or make them have a timeout or anything like that. Thing is, they need to say to the child, oh my gosh, what's going on? Why are you so angry? Help me understand. Okay. And so then the child tells their side of it. And it might be something we don't buy into, but we accept what they're saying because this is their story. Um, and then, you know, oh, well, I can understand now why you would feel that way. I might feel that way if that happened to me. And then being curious, just asking, you know, more questions. And the empathy is in there all, all the way. So that what you're doing is opening up for the connection for yourself and for the child, especially for the child, instead of, you know, getting stressed out and punishing the child, you know. And I think that one of the other um, techniques that I learned from Dr. Hughes is that um, instead of doing time out, time in, I think it actually came from play therapy, uh, theraplay. But so when you have a child that, you know, typically you'd put in a time out, you said, you know, I think you need to be near me more, you know, so you can calm down and have some quiet time and you just put something, have them at the kitchen table, coloring, whatever they're doing. It's not um, a consequence as you would think of a consequence, but it's something, it's an intervention that you're doing. Wow. I'm going to pause here because this <laughs> is such fabulous advice for every parent, adoptive parents, not, you know, bio parents, mm -hmm. place. Playful, yes. loving, accepting, curious, empathic. Yeah. Perfect. These are things, let's put this up in our kitchen, mm -hmm. right? Even no matter for grandparents, for everybody. Right. Playful, loving, accepting, curious, empathic. And that's perfect because that's easy. We can all get our arms around. When in doubt, can I find something in place mm -hmm. can is there a part of me that can turn this into playful a playful place i can always find something in my gut that allows me to be loving i can always as you said i can accept this child's story it's their story they're mm -hmm. they're seeing things in a way i can't see them because i'm not in their shoes so mm -hmm. the accepting part curious one of my favorite words asking questions mm -hmm. not judging curiosity takes us away from judging and reprimanding you know punitive behaviors into mm -hmm. saying why and then the empathy something we can use in every relationship I think if the parent isn't able to do that, a certain situation comes up with their child where they can't get to that place, then that's an indication something's going on there that's triggering, right? So it could be something that happened to them at that age. I remember when my son was a teenager and he was, we were ha I mean, I remember where we were standing and everything and we we're like, kind of having this argument and I think he wasn't accepting what I was saying and I felt really rejected you know I could just feel it in my gut and then I thought oh when I was his age I felt rejected you know sometimes by friends somebody sometimes somebody that I liked that didn't like me that just you know really you know rock my world and so then i thought okay once i understand what it was about it was so much easier to move forward thank you for sharing that because it highlights a piece you and i know this as clinicians you and i understand this we we have to really work on ourselves mm -hmm. a lot to be therapists right. to be good therapists mm -hmm. and yet so many parents who aren't they're, they're, most parents aren't clinicians. Most parents aren't psychologists. Mm -hmm. It is so 
I just have to pause because you hit on something so critical, particularly for this listener's question, where she's mm -hmm. acknowledging, hey, I have trauma here. And as much as we work on our trauma, we also have to appreciate it doesn't dissolve it. There mm -hmm. even really good trauma work, there will be moments when a little piece of it, just like, you know, a dandelion, you know, pops up because we didn't fully get that root. And that's part of life. Trauma mm -hmm. is trauma, and we can work on it and think we got it all, but often there's there's something that'll find its way up, and that's normal, and that's mm -hmm. natural. But I love how you focused on something in you, in your gut, said, ugh. And that sense, I've had that sense too, where it's almost like you can feel this is old stuff. This isn't about this interaction. It's too big or too something. It's not really about this interaction with this child or this partner. Mm -hmm. This is something old. And that is such a perfect, you modeled how beautifully you were able to realize it in the moment because you've done a lot of work, right? So mm -hmm. you're able to realize it, do a course correction. But for those who, who haven't, you know, done a lot of self-work or in the middle of a lot of self-work or have worked on their trauma, yet it's find it's still popping up at times. It's not that you're bad. It's not that you're broken. It's not that you're, you're an, a horrible parent or a horrible person. It's that you're like the rest of us. You're imperfect. And because yeah. we are imperfect and because parenting being is imperfect that all we want to do is to learn to listen to those pieces like came up for you with your son mm -hmm. to listen to it and if you need help with it because it's not something you know how to handle either in the moment or when you mm -hmm. have time later that's when you get to go back to your therapist or seek a therapist to say mm -hmm. oh this is coming up and I want to resolve it I think that you know the flip side of that is you know, imagine these children who have, you have a child in your home who's been left alone for three days because a parent was on a drug run or the parents were, there was a lot of domestic violence and they were witness to that. There's physical and sexual abuse. So they build up defenses against that. When something, you know, just in terms of that gut, gut level of feeling, there are two types of, of memories when we're talking about development. One is implicit and one is explicit. Typically, implicit memories happen before the child begins to talk. Once they're talking and they have words for it, it becomes explicit. So if the child, when the child was a baby, was left alone for three days, no, no food or no love, no anything, um, that is really frightening. And so that's internalized. We feel things in our body. Our body has a memory of things. And so a child like who had experienced that, a feeling come, come up, they have no idea where it came from and they act out. Um, and that's part of therapy too, for, you know, to work with the child to develop a coherent narrative. Like, how do you make sense of this? You know, and then if they have a coherent narrative, uh, a coherent life story, then they begin to have more security. I love that you brought up how important it is to have the child because we do have that. We all have implicit memories, memories mm -hmm. stored in the body and you know, they get triggered by things and mm -hmm. we may not realize what it's about. And then the explicit memory, the ability to say, oh, I remember when mom and dad left me at the gas station and they're able mm -hmm. to verbalize it. But how important that is for children who are being adopted to be able to make it through that, to make mm -hmm. a story that makes sense. And yet you're also reminding me again, taking it back to humanity as a whole, how for most people, there is some of this work to do. A lot of adoptive children who are adopted have had it much, much worse than many people can ever imagine. Mm -hmm. But that these are concepts that, so we're not trying to scare people away from mm -hmm. adopting children at all. We're trying to say, wait, these are things that happen in many households in bio families. Mm -hmm. And it's Yes. And for many, you and I, uh, you know, I work a lot with adults and I work with adults who have these implicit memories hidden mm -hmm. running the show, causing them to act out in adult relationships. A lot of 
a lot of people who are not adopted have these very same issues. So mm. we're not in this conversation trying to scare people simply to raise awareness and say, this is another element and you may not realize once you bring this lovely child into your mm -hmm. home that there's going to be some extra special healing work. Mm -hmm. And I love to look at it that way where it's about helping this child heal, helping mm -hmm. this child come into your fold and the fold of your imperfect, mm -hmm. but very safe and loving family. Right. Right. And, and, you know, it's definitely, there's a wide range of behaviors that you're going to see and not every child is going to have, you know, disturbing behaviors. Um, and some of them can heal faster than others. Typically, there's a honeymoon period of about three months where everything's just flowing along and everything's lovely. And then all of a sudden, it starts acting up. I think really it's about if the parent can anticipate that some of this may happen and lower their expectations. Like when they're doing the infertility work, what was their vision of their child? Was it? Having in a student, was it having somebody that looks like them? Was it having somebody that's athletic? What's going to happen if that is your ideal and you get a child, you adopt a child that is not those things? So you have to kind of shift your expectations. You may have to lower your expectations. You know, if a child is here, like emotionally, developmentally, and you're coming at them this way, it's not going to work. You have to get down to where they are, realize where they are and help them to grow from there. You can't just, you know, cut off certain things. You got to just take it at their speed and, you know, help to move them along. And thanks for pointing out that part about expectations, because even in bio families that is often so much of the rub where mm -hmm. the mom or the dad wants the child who's a carbon copy of them and they don't get that so they're really hard on the child or making the child feel like an utter disappointment and here we can see thank you for tying it back into looking at the the grieving around the fertility mm -hmm. because if you're I had never thought of this as, as a component of it. So thank you. You're so wise to look and say, if these are my expectations and I want a child who is, you know, six foot and brown eyed and black hair. And I get right. a little, a child who has red hair and who will, you know, be a tiny little thing I need out of service to myself and to this other human being to allow them to be who they are which is the essence of parenting in, yeah. in any event to God. But you're saying, if I'm hearing you right, bring it into awareness, have conversations, be real about this mm -hmm. so that you, instead of turning your back on this child who just wants to be loved mm -hmm. yeah. and every child wants to be loved and safe, mm -hmm. loved, safe, and adored. That's what kids want. Right. So right. that thank you for really focusing on that it's so important and is there any other piece i know we could talk for hours about this is there any other piece that you think it's really important to highlight today yeah i think i mean in my adoption career um outside of my private practice i placed 100 children i have looked at my stats when i left that um job and most of them were successful adoptions. Um, not all of them had severe issues. And I just, kids need to have a family. And I, if, if people feel that they have the capacity to parent and they have roadblocks, don't stop there. You know, get some help for yourself. Get educated. You know, ask questions. Um, you know, it's it's one thing we didn't talk about is that if you're adopting a child from foster care, there's going to likely be a reunification period where they may be having visits with the birth parents. That's pretty hard. 
for the adoptive parents. But if it's good for the child, then it should happen. It may be give the child a better way of understanding, be able to um, say goodbye to their birth parents. Um, but I just really think that anything we do in life, whether it's ac academic um, goals or personal goals, career goals, it's not all smooth along the way. There's, you know, there's bumps in the road. And I think, you know, for most adoptive families, things can work out and the child can heal. One more piece. I'm going, thank you for, for that element. So important to look at things like a reunification visit with parents and having to have your own personal house in order to be able to tolerate that because that could be very triggering so mm -hmm. really taking us back to doing your personal work knowing you may need to do a lot of personal work and I mm -hmm. personally love doing personal work because mm -hmm. the more challenges that come up it's like oh okay so I've got to go back and address this I continue right. to evolve but I want to just touch on the one piece where you mentioned the honeymoon period, that three month honeymoon period. And now this is me imagining that I would imagine that that is that child, that first three months, everything is good and new and fun for everyone likely. <laughs> and then is it that the child, once that we hit, you know, somewhere about four months where the child says, okay, I'm going to test. I'm going to test the waters to see if you're, of course, they're not doing it consciously, but I could imagine them unconsciously testing, is this new family safe? Yeah. Is this mom and dad going to boot me out like this foster family or that family or like my own mom and dad? Mm -hmm. So being able, and I'm imagining you're the expert here, is that's what starts to happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, that's part of it is the testing. And the other part of it is they may be starting to feel comfortable by then and then they relax and just let it all hang out. But I do think part of it is, you know, okay, are you, do you love me now that I did this? Are you still going to keep me, you know, are you, and that's a fear that they have that this is going to be temporary, just like every other placement was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm, I'm smiling just a bit because it reminds me of how this is just part of being human. When we mm -hmm. get into love relationships and we're dating, there's that honeymoon period. And then as people start saying, okay, now, how right. do you like me when I have uh -huh. anxiety? Do you like me when I have a temper tantrum? Do you like me when I don't balance, you know, my finances very well? Uh -huh. So we can look at all of these parts of adoption as very, very special and unique, yet also a part of the natural journey of being a human of being a parent, of being a loving person on the planet. Yes, I think that's true. And like you said, there's so much more, you know, that we could talk about that we, there's no way we can cover everything. So, um, but I think that if people are committed and they educate themselves and get the therapy they need for themselves, then they start to value therapy too. So when the child's in therapy, they'll, you know, they'll value it more. All those things, um, you know, I think adoption's a wonderful thing. And I just feel for the kids so much that I just hope, you know, that more people will consider adopting. Thank you. And I can really see how it's a win-win because if you have unresolved stuff, as we, again, everybody mm -hmm. does but here is a reason to really if you don't want to dive into your personal world and become a better person for yourself then mm -hmm. which is the ideal of course that's what we want to right. do but now right. here's another reason to do it another reason to be a better parent to a bio child a better parent to an adoptive mm -hmm. child and you have placed kudos to you dr denise a hundred children which means there are a hundred fewer children in foster homes or out on the street or wherever they would have ended up mm -hmm. without your your loving gift and your guidance so thank you thank you for the work you do and continue mm -hmm. to do yeah well it's been a real gift to me too 
Well, thank you. And where can our listeners find you? Um, I am I'm from California, but the last four years I've been living in southern New Mexico. And I do a lot of online therapy. Um, I still have some clients in California and I can I do um parent coaching online. Some sometimes something comes up and sometimes it's something that you can kind of just, you know, address in a bit of time without people making, you know, months and months of um, commitment. Okay. Parent coaching, fabulous yeah. resource. So mm-hmm. email address, oh, website I, address. Right. My email is Dr. Denise W at gmail.com. Okay. Dr. Denise W for Wagner at gmail.com. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today. Such a wealth of wisdom and information, Dr. Denise. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Yeah. And for our listener, you have given, and for all parents out there, you have given us so much rich, heartfelt information. Thank mm-hmm. you. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And listeners, thank you for joining us today. And this is Imperfect Love. Thanks so much for sharing your time with me today. Remember, you have the power to transform your life and love fearlessly, if imperfectly. And it's my privilege to help you along the way. You can find more life-changing content, including my books and other podcast episodes, at drcarlamanley.com. Feel free to submit your own confidential questions through my website. I'll do my very best to include your issue on a future episode. If you found this podcast helpful, please subscribe and leave a review. Until we connect again, this is Dr. Carla Marie Manley wishing you oceans of blessings and love. Please note, this podcast is psychoeducational in nature and is not intended to replace formal mental health support. Please contact your healthcare provider or emergency hotline if you need psychiatric care. And as always, please take good care of your amazing, wonderful self.